If you are vulnerable to psychic damage from roguish language, stay away from these gibbering mouths. But if you intend on listening to this podcast about enriching your fantastical group hallucinations, you're too far gone already. Your next game is going to be naturally wise, and here's why. In this episode, we're finding answers to what traits are core to role-playing the druid? And where does the concept of druid come from? And what characters can give us some inspiration for our next druids, or current? Welcome to the Hook and Chance podcast, I'm Jordan. And I'm his brother, Travis. I bet you have no idea what we're talking about today. <laughs> Only said it like three times. <laughs> How stupid do you think I am? <laughs> Druids are one of those classes that draw upon real-world historical cultures. The challenge with this one in particular is that the odds are about 50-50 whether Wizards of the Coast got more accurate about their true history than what we actually know about Druids as a society. (laughs) That seems bad. Yeah, and I know you're thinking, that's dumb. You probably just didn't look into it enough. But the Druids had a strict rule of not writing anything down. They were all about using their memory banks. So what we know about druids comes from modern day archeology span and basically whatever Julius Caesar wrote down about them when he talked to them. So there is just one minor problem with that in that yes, Julius Caesar was kind of the historian or at least Julius Caesar's historians wrote down their interactions with the original druids, except that Julius Caesar is also responsible for wiping them out of existence. Yeah, and you don't really want to listen to that person. I mean, historically, the victors have never painted a historically accurate picture of the people that they killed and slaughtered mercilessly. Yeah, so the point there is that there's a lot of legends out there about druids, which is kind of neat, but we don't know much. However, what Julius Caesar's historians did write down, there was some bits that made druids sound pretty fucking badass. Absolutely. One of them is unfortunately a chronicle of their last stand. But it was called the Fall of Mona. This is what supposedly happened. In 60 AD, the Romans rolled into this island of Mona, and Tacitus, a Roman historian, described it as follows. On the shore stood the opposing army with the densest array of armed warriors. Between the ranks dashed women, attired in black like the Furies, with their hair disheveled, waving burning brands. All around them were the Druids lifting up their hands to heaven and pouring forth dreadful implications. Our soldiers were so petrified by the unfamiliar sight that as if their limbs were paralyzed, they stood motionless, exposed to wounds. That's some uh, whole person right there, if I'm not mistaken. That's some cool ass shit right (laughs) there, yes. Strike fear into the hearts of your enemies because druids are masters of their domain. Yeah, get the hell out of these forests, dummies. So what we're trying to do today is we want to figure out how to play druids that are deep and mysterious and maybe a little unpredictable and have the feeling of meaty incantations and rites and rituals. Beyond just being the weirdo that lives out in a shack and has a bit of a green thumb. (laughs) I mean... Which is fun to play. Yeah. Do that if you want. But we love druids. Like, one of my favorite characters is a druid. He's He's a little gnarly goblin who's a circle of spores druid that like chews weird potions up in his mouth and just regurgitates it into fallen friends' mouths when he's trying to (laughs) heal them. Oh, it's nasty. I've always loved druids because, sure, they have the nature theme, but they also have this lack of morality, but it's not like other characters do. It's like they are better because they don't have all of this shit weighing them down. They don't have cultural morals in the same way that the rest of us do. Yeah. And of course, if we briefly take a dip into what they can do in the game, they're amazing. They can soak up damage like nobody else with their animal forms. 
they're spellcasting badasses. Like, I don't know where you can play a tank and a spellcaster at the yeah. same time. It's so cool. That can control the battlefield like gangbusters, too. Oh, hell yeah. They're part healers. They can bring you up when you're going down. They have one of my favorite healing spells, Reincarnate, which brings you back in a random body. I mean, when you want to re-up, just know a druid. Yeah. So treat yourself like shit, then get reincarnated by a druid. And I mean, really, if you are a rogue or a bard, your best friend should be a druid. A, they might be your moral compass. And B, they can just reincarnate you back into a body with a stable liver. There you go. Drink like there's no tomorrow. (laughs) And then, of course, they can stealth as well as any other party member because they can pop out those little rat feet whenever they want. Who suspects the rat? I guess people that know about druids would. (laughs) And then you're just running around suspecting every single rat that you come across. Yeah. Interrogate that rat. I want to know its (laughs) secrets. Every time. There's no end to this suspicion that you have. (laughs) This sounds like a slow descent into madness. Anyways. I'm going to do that with the next guard NPC. He's just holding a rat in front of his face. (laughs) Tell me. (laughs) Tell me where they went. (laughs) This little shit did it. I caught him. (laughs) He knows more than he's saying. All right. So what we're going to do today is we're going to jump into the kinship camp where we're going to rip through some of the core traits and how we can maybe extrapolate and make our druids more meaty and more fun. So let's go there now. This is kinship camp where rich histories and diverse quirks are explored between weary adventurers around the safety of the fire. So let's start by talking about some of the key factors of druids, the key traits and things that you think of when you think of druids. What comes up? Avengers of all the wrongs of mankind. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Protectors of the natural world. Yeah, all right, like uh, eco-terrorism. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) When somebody cuts down a tree, you march into town and cut down one of them. (laughs) There you go. Also, my grandma, who likes to garden. (laughs) So Druid sits somewhere between (laughs) eco-terrorist and grandma? Yeah. Wow. That's my uh, exposure to Druids. Yeah, well, people with green thumbs, you know, plant caretakers, uh, folks that like gardens. Yeah. Those are also druids. Grandma, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I think of wolves and bears and bear wolf shape changing folk. The ass of a bear, the head of a wolf, the most powerful combination (laughs) known to man. Deadly. (laughs) And I think of all of the ways that they can kind of manipulate the battlefield and the environment to suit their needs. Yeah, like Calling on thunderstorms and fog clouds and thorn whip and uh, spike growth and all of that kind of stuff that really does make the battlefield a nightmare Yeah, for other enemies. There's a lot of fun stuff that comes to mind, but the main traits of druids that we think are core to the class that we want to cover in this segment are wisdom, their wild shape, knowledge of nature, and the history of actual druids and what that can lend to your character. So let's start up at the top with wisdom. Now, the biggest challenge with playing druids, and this is kind of my challenge with playing, say, investigators or spies or masterminds, is that I'm not actually any of those. Right, right, right. You got a soft brain. I do. <laughs> I do. It's very mushy. <laughs> and it's tricky to play wise characters and make wise decisions when you're just one of six people sitting at a table trying to make the best choices you have for your character and trying to think, well, what would my character do? For those that have a high wisdom score, that can be a real challenge. Yeah, for sure. So you kind of put together a list of key traits to try to play up. Ones that don't actually rely on how wise you are but more decisions that are made by wise people in the way that they approach problems. Yeah, and I mean, maybe this can actually make you a little wiser. Maybe I'll try and become a little wiser. But things that wise people do are they know things are always more complicated than they seem on the surface. 
So in game, I could see a lot of different scenarios where the team and the party is jumping to conclusions. Well, that guy did it. Or they're taking things at surface value that the DM is putting in front of them. Yeah, following every red herring. <laughs> well, the key to playing a wise character is not necessarily knowing all of the other options or presenting them, but just knowing that they exist. Yeah. So calming the rest of the party down is a really cool role for a druid to play. Hey, there's many different facets to this situation. We do not know all the facts. We will continue to discover them. There's a lot at play here. They treat the illness and not the symptoms. And I really like this because this means you're almost playing like a bit of a investigative character. They know that there's always something behind the actions of another. You could even play this up as getting to know your allies better. Like, why do you, good rogue, act out in the ways that you do? <laughs> What's going on here? Easy. You're going to start playing psychiatrist. Don't tug on that thread with the rogue. That is a deep thread. Yeah. It will unravel their whole being. <laughs> well, even when you're looking at the different quests that your party has available, you know, the first thing that the shopkeeper asks you to go to do on this quest, immediately start questioning the why behind that and behind that and behind everything. Why would we be sent on this quest? And again, there doesn't necessarily need to be the answer, but the fact that your character's questioning them will make them seem more wise. Yeah, and a DM that's done some planning always wants that question, so give it to them. And if they want, they can brush it off. This is a great one. They know that knee-jerk impulses are the worst thing to act on. So there's going to be a lot of interplay between like the barbarians of your group or the every other class that people play as being... <laughs> Well, you're not kidding, because every other class has something behind them. And again, this goes back to that druids don't have that morality. So you've got the rogue who definitely wants to stab something. You've got the barbarian who wants to rage on something. You've got the cleric that wants to bless something. <laughs> or fix some moral problem of the world. Everybody has this other ulterior motivation, a lens that they're going to see the entire world through. And what's really cool about druids is, yeah, they're going to jump to these knee-jerk reactions, and all you have to do as a druid who is wise is just ask them to reflect. Calm yourself, brother. Why are you making this decision? Yeah, I like that. They consult others. Wise people consult everyone to get all of the different perspectives because they know they don't know it all. And this can be as simple as when the party is having a discussion, you as the druid have an obligation as a wise druid to involve everyone. So the player that is being quiet, whether it's in character or in real life, ask them, what do you think of this situation? And part of that is that wise people know that with different perspectives comes some good ideas. So that's why a druid is part of an adventuring party made of people from different <laughs> classes and different backgrounds. You don't say. And finally, they know to remain objective or they can be corrupted by their own biases. And again, all of those different classes, they all have their different biases. Even that guard has the bias of thinking all druids are shit and to grab that rat. <laughs> Tell me where they are. <laughs> Back to the rat. <laughs> the rat interrogation. Oh, I ain't getting off of that train. The final trick to playing wise characters, just keep Google handy and Google wise quotes. Oh, and hell yeah. dole them out whenever <laughs> the party lulls for a half a second. You can just drop some ancient wisdom like the wise words of Carl Jung. Thinking is difficult. That's why most judge. I want to use that as like a retort to some asshole yeah. NPC <laughs> or, or the rogue again. That'd be great. Another good one for that situation. Most people would rather die than think. In fact, most do. That's almost like a half a threat in there. Yeah, that's yeah. You, this is a veiled threat. <laughs> Wisdom threats. All right, moving on to their ability to wild shape, which is arguably some of the most exciting druid shit in the game. And something that is kind of talked about in the D&D &D circles is if a druid is able to turn into these animals, 
they should deeply understand the animal and how it thinks and how it moves and behaves. So I think that can be a great source of inspiration for how your druid's personality comes together. It can be taken from those animals that they prefer to morph into. Or even the animals that they see a kinship with and really understand and connect with. I mean, rules as written say that a druid just has to be able to see it. They must yeah. have seen it before. And that's all well and good. And mechanically, it's pretty cool because you've kind of got this whole laundry list of animals based on any situation. That you can just boom, wild shape, wild shape, wild shape, wild shape, wild shape into any <laughs> animal that you could possibly need in that moment. Yeah. Historically, instead of shifting into different animals, human beings, when they see a new animal, they simply eat it. Are you suggesting that druids just consume the animal that they're... <laughs> no. Maybe they do, though. Maybe they shift into it. Well, you could also, as a druid, look to try to prioritize one particular wild shape that kind of embodies your character's core traits, like loyal to allies and valuing your comrades might make you a bit of a wolf. Yeah, that might be the animal that you choose for most situations or you know if you're a bear shifter maybe your character is a little bit more relaxed and curious but less aggressive but ferocious when prodded yeah that could take a lot of different forms in how you want to play your character when they're not shifted as well so all of these different traits kind of play into your character and how you role play in general and i think this has so much potential for flavor I mean, it all depends what kind of a character you're playing, but shifting into an animal could be anything from, you know, like a peaceful moment of bliss with nature to like a vicious rending of your body and like some body horror werewolf kind of stuff. Well, it makes sense that it does take some effort to wild shape. I mean, it's kind of right there in the rules that you can only do so a number of times per day and only for a certain amount of time. Yeah. So it stands to reason that it's probably pretty taxing for a druid to change their molecular structure to match that of an eagle. Yeah, I'd say so. So? I mean, it's really hard for me to drop a few pounds. <laughs> to turn it into an eagle, you have to lose a lot of weight. <laughs> it takes months. <laughs> so play it up. Play up the struggle and the strife that your character goes through in order to become those animals. Next is their natural knowledge and nature magic. Druids, as written in D&D, are very nature-based. This doesn't mean you always have to play them as a nature-worshipping wise sage from the woods. I mean, consider, if you will, some of our previous episodes about bugs and rodents and all kinds of different animals. I mean, nature is straight fucked. It is <laughs> scary shit. That's our inspiration for every horror-themed episode that we've done thus far. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Go find some shit in nature, and it will scare the bejesus out of you. It's a spooky place. That's why we hang out in this podcast studio. <laughs> Stay indoors where the nature can't get you. That's why I play in my imagination. So your druid can be anything. It can be that wise, comfortable, approachable druid. It can also be an apex predator that kills for sport and fun. Your druid can be a straight up psycho. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, we're talking about a world in which nature includes terrible monsters. <laughs> Purple worms. Yeah. Mother nature did not invent that shit. <laughs> but in this fantasy world, it did. Well, in the research for this episode, we actually did come across a really cool quote that was created by Redditor Varsal, who kind of encapsulated this in that you don't necessarily have to play the comfy, cozy druid. A peace-loving, everyone-get-along kind of druid. Nature is balance. Nature is fairness. And this was written in kind of a in-character style. You heard a druid was coming, and you pictured the spring seed, the tender fiddlehead, the glow of harvest wheat and pleasant picnics in calm forest glens. And so you were not afraid. But I am the strike of lightning. I am the raging forest fire. 
I am the root that breaks stone. I'm the roar of the landslide. I am the tsunami that smashes cities. I am the inevitable destruction that makes way for new life and rebirth. That ain't friendly. That's cool. Yes. So you can play whatever kind of druid you want. And it still falls under that nature theme. Think outside the box. You could be a city-dwelling, alleyway slinking druid. Some urchin druid who's running through the urban jungle and getting shit done. You could just be a druid of the skies and seas out in the middle of the ocean, just hanging out on a raft. You don't need to be in forests or jungles. Everything is natural. Absolutely. We've been talking about a lot of wild druid stuff. So maybe we can take it a step back and talk about the actual druids. Some of the interesting things that I would pull into a druid character if I was trying to base them off of what they were really like is that they were community leaders. Like each community that a druid was in saw them as a religious and spiritual advisor. And there were often even the judges of certain issues and cases that would come up. Super important figures. And what I think is neat is that we all know this concept of like a circle of druids. It's in D&D and it was in real life. But they would gather at these sacred spots throughout the year, and then each druid would go to their individual homes and communities, kind of as like representatives of this druid circle. And that means when their communities would come together, these druids would know each other. They'd kind of wave from across the battlefield if they were going to war or something like that. Hey, Jerry, what's up? And (laughs) they would have a quick chat, go back to their own side and say, hey, let's not go to war. We can work this out. So this is really where they get this wisdom vibe, this peacekeeping vibe, this all is fair and all is balanced because they were trying to keep a whole bunch of warring tribes from kicking the living shit out of each other. Yeah, because we all know humans like to fight and druids were a little bit above that. Another fun little tidbit for this is that they believed in a form of reincarnation. So they thought that the soul would reach out and find a new body when you died after a fixed number of years, which meant it was a little easier to spur on their warriors to die noble deaths on the battlefield. Holy shit. Because you'd just get another body real quick. And that's where the spell reincarnation comes in with the druids. That concept, yeah. It all comes full circle. (laughs) I also really like that they were super into divination. And I think that this can influence your character in so many more ways than just a spell that does it. They would use all kinds of forms of augury and reading the signs from nature. They could tell you about your lucky or unlucky days coming up or the best time to start a new endeavor in any flavor in the world of prophecy. (laughs) Well, this is super easy to do as a player of a druid is you just start making prophecies all over the place. If you're struggling as a druid to find a reason why they would be out in the world instead of away from their people or whatever their background is, following around a group of murder hobos questing their way around the world, all you got to do is make a prophecy up of one of the characters in the party. I mean, you could go two different directions hey, you're destined for great things. Or, hey, you're gonna die. (laughs) I want to see it. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe, I don't know. I'm trying to stop you from dying because you're going to throw yourself into a pit of lava. Or even something a little more selfish, like you're prophesied to bring good things to my community. So I'm going to try and keep you alive until that happens. That's sweet. I like that. And you can uh, flavor this with all kinds of natural interpretations too. Like, the druids would observe things like the clouds and the heavenly bodies. U rods were a common tool that they would use with lettering carved into them. Or they could gain answers from birdsong, sneezing, (laughs) dream interpretations, and more. Given what we know now, I would suggest that maybe that is not the most scientific method to predict the future. But I guess, what is? Yeah, what is? (laughs) And I have seasonal allergies, so I think I'm going to be making a lot more prophecies (laughs) in the next month or two. It's starting up. He's going to start prophesizing anytime now. If you want a prophecy, give him a call. Oh, yeah. 
DM me and I'll give you a prophecy based on my most recent sneeze. <laughs> Great. But in character, you could do more interesting things like croaking of the ravens or the chirping of the wrens. Yeah, just walk around being like, that wren over there told me that you gonna die. <laughs> just for your character too, fun note is that there's a couple different kinds of interpreting nature like this. There's the intuitive type, which is where you are getting direct messages through your dreams or from like a bird is literally talking to you. <laughs> or there's the more interpretive way where you're seeing the drops of rain and, and coming to conclusions from that. Reading the chicken bones on the ground. Yeah. Got it. Well, we hope that helps. We hope that adds a little more spice to your druid. And if it did, maybe reach out. Let us know. What change did you make to your druid as a result of some of these ideas? Did you spice up your druid with a little extra flavor? Or tell us what great druid ideas you have that we didn't talk about. Hell, so that I yes. can make my druid better. <laughs> <laughs> His druid needs to be a lot better. It oh, really does. And I have another point uh, about the community mindset of the druids. Oh, if I may, by all means, the rest of the party can really interact with the druid if you're going to play this style of druid, too, because if a druid in your world is a respected member of communities, then as the rogue, I can actually respect the druid. I don't have to be an asshole about it. I can mm. look to them for wisdom and advice and like druids. No shit. I should turn to the druid when I'm having a struggle. You're saying that a rogue <laughs> would actually turn to the druid and ask them their advice before they did some dumb shit? Maybe a fighter or something. <laughs> yeah, in a million years or when pigs fly. Which the druid can do. Well, let's move on to the Griffin Street Market, shall we? Must have provisions and supplies can be found for the right price at the Griffin Street Market. Step right on up. We have a great item for you today. Jordan, tell them what we have. I've got the pretty much best thing you've ever seen because have you ever wanted something as bad as you've wanted one of those cars that turns into a submarine? You know those? what I'm talking about? Yeah, like James Bond had one. Yeah, and that's the coolest shit ever. We've got that? I've got better than that. Okay. It can go land or sea up to 900 feet below the surface. This baby stays watertight. Not only that, it can attack and grab people or objects. And what does it look like, you might ask? Uh, like, wheels? Never get that straight out of your head. It's got legs and claws. It's a big old tank lobster that you <laughs> crawl into. Wow. Well, that's pretty cool. Like, as far as, as uh, vehicles go or even mobility aids, like... You're going to capture some real attention. People will respect a lobster tank. Yeah, especially if you keep snapping those pinchers. Well, that's great. It is known as the apparatus of Qualish. Very cool. When did we get that in our inventory? Oh, just a week ago. Huh. Well, uh, you, you can have the apparatus of Qualish for the low, low price. Tell them how much it is, Jordan. 500 thousand gold pieces i got a really bad deal on the back end <laughs> holy shit who can afford this i got it in an auction and it kind of got out of hand 500 grand you're not allowed to control our money anymore <laughs> oh my god okay what else that's stupid we have something that might truly be useful then describe which is a tool that's truly changed the way that we dungeon master our games and engage our players in meaningful ways i am finally behind you on this one i am notoriously always feeling unprepared and the trick i have discovered if you have every option at your fingertips you can flex with anything your players throw at you you can start to feel comfortable while being uncomfortably prepared and the way to do that is with describe because you get, like, at this point, I think maybe over 1,800 at least professionally written descriptions for every location, item, spell, NPC, monster, or lair of evil that your players could ever dream of encountering. 
You just search it, and you don't need to prep. Like this one called Very Rough Seas. The roaring waves rise like mountains against the storm-wracked horizon. Lightning flashes and thunder rolls. The sea foams white in rage before crashing down again, sending salt-laced spray skyward. The dark, roiling sea hides many dangers, the least of which are its monumental waves. Wow, I am unprepared for this adventure. The sea will devour you! And at least this one is a far cry from 500,000 gold. This one is actually <laughs> affordable. Yeah, to have a team of writers at your back, I'd say so. You can try it out for free, and you can find them at describe.com forward slash hook. That's D-S-C-R-Y-B dot com forward slash hook. And then use the coupon code hook and get yourself 10% off. Now let's get back to the extra dimensional gateway. This is the extra dimensional gateway. Where unique heroes from strange alternate realities are recruited. So one of the most fun things to do with D&D characters is kind of base them on loosely at least your favorite pop culture characters. Well, George, you and I always have so much fun trying to think, well, what would this character be if it were a D&D &D character? Yeah. I think that when you start getting real deep into D&D, &D, your brain goes there sometimes. And we tried to think of who are the most druidic characters that we could base some really cool druids off of. Which is kind of a tricky one. Like, there's definitely a lot more fighters than there are druids. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, if we're going to break the druid down, I mean, we've kind of already talked about its nature leanings and its wise leanings. So I took the nature route. All right. And I landed at Swamp Thing. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Swamp Thing, it's a really cool character. It's actually one of the few DC characters. Like, I'm not a big DC fan. I like Batman and I like Swamp Thing. <laughs> what about Fastman? Eh. I could give two shits about the Flash. <laughs> Sorry. If you're unfamiliar with Swamp Thing, Alec Holland was an idealistic scientist who was synthesizing a top secret chemical in his hidden lab in the marshlands, but after a bomb in his office explodes, he's murdered, or so it seems, because rising in his place is the Swamp Thing, a creature made of vegetation that's absorbed Alec Holland's memories, personality, and grief. Oh, so you like them dark characters is what you're saying. Of course I do. <laughs> so Swamp Thing can control plant life, everything from fungus on stale bread to entire oak forests. He's superhumanly strong. He's kind of grotesque. He can grow himself into a massive body or the tiniest little twig sprout or forest thing. Very cool. Epically powerful. So what made me think of this originally a comic that I'd once read that was actually a crossover between my two favorite DC characters, Swamp Thing and Batman. And what really kind of captured my attention and made me think of it was the way that Swamp Thing handled this story. So spoiler alert, if you intend on reading this <laughs> one issue crossover standalone comic from like the 90s, highly recommended. I won't tell you how it ends. Basically in the story, Batman is pursuing Killer Croc. Killer Croc escaped from Arkham Asylum, and he's running out into the woods. And he goes to the nearest swamp near Gotham, and he's in there, and he's fighting gators and doing all that kind of stuff. And Batman, being the awesome detective that he is, tracks him down, and he starts beating the living shit out of Killer Croc and saying, no, you're coming back to me. I'm putting you in a padded cell in Arkham. And then Swamp Thing just busts up and he's like, actually, you're not. You're in my house. Here's some cool spores to trip <laughs> balls on. And I'm going to show you a little bit of empathy for Killer Croc because he was a kid that was beaten up and treated really poorly his whole life because of the way he looked. And it was kind of cool because like in that comic, Swamp Thing showed Batman that 
like we were just talking about in this episode, not all things are as simple as they seem. Your mortal laws and uh, dumb shit ideas sometimes don't matter in the world of nature. And you know what? Killer Croc is actually going to be a lot less harmful, and he's just going to chill out here in the swamp where he belongs, where he feels comfortable. And there was like wisdom and nature all mixed into that one story. It was super cool. Nice. And then the crocodile lawyers came out of the swamp. <laughs> Wait, what? And started debating the case. The <laughs> no, druid crocs. That didn't happen. Don't listen to them. <laughs> Fine. That sounds like a very good story. What do you got? Well, first I'll agree with you. Swamp Thing is a super badass character that I enjoy very deeply. But the other side of this coin is that wisdom and my characters that I'm going to throw out there aren't always super associated with nature, but I realized that in the classic hero's journey, there's a point at which the main hero encounters their guide. Hmm. And that guide embodies wisdom in most cases. And sometimes, if they do have a bit of a natural theme to them, would make a pretty good inspiration for druids. Well, and if we're being honest, most parties need some guidance. <laughs> Yes, very true. So if you want to introduce an NPC druid, pull from these as well. Well, I'm thinking as a player at the table, time to embody some of the characters that are meant as those fixtures in the hero's journey of the wise sage that gives this troubled youth some damn guidance. Yeah. So who is your character? Well, I don't just have one because that's too easy. Of course. <laughs> Here's a few for you. We got a classic. Got to include Yoda on this list from Star Wars. I mean, he's a little swamp creature that has nothing but wisdom and hilarity. Fair enough. I don't know what else he would be. He's definitely a druid. And pulling bits of him, bits of him. Don't just do the Yoda voice. Think about the rest of his character, all right? Yeah. Then I realized that Disney's actually got a couple to give us as well. You've got Rafiki from The Lion King. <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> sure he was making prophecies all over the place yeah he was bashing his buddies on the head with his shillelagh <laughs> <laughs> knocking some sense <laughs> into simba with a shillelagh i get it yeah. i like the idea of like a druid character just like rapping people on the head just be like don't do that stupid thing yeah knock him in the melon <laughs> and from that same movie i think great inspirations believe it or not for druids are timon and pumbaa <laughs> got a simple life philosophy of mellowing out and existing in nature as it is snacking on some beetles yeah i dig it then we've got baloo from the jungle book a beloved character from my youth just need the bare necessities <laughs> mother nature's recipes forget about your worries and your strife <laughs> yeah we all remember how the song goes <laughs> all right a couple more quick ones bringing dc back into the picture I know it might not seem like it, but Ra's al Ghul from Batman Begins is actually super wise and could be argued to have the mindset of a druid with no empathy. Holy shit. He's an evil druid. Yeah. Wow. And he doesn't even start as one. He's pretty like you, you get his idea and then he turns dark and he says, we got to wipe cities off the map. He's a druid. He's trying to get rid of humanity's sins and crimes and corruptness. Yeah, he just wants to go reset back to what is truly moral and good, which is nature. Yeah. And then finally, to round off the list, we've got Splinter from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> okay, he's not a druid. Splinter is definitely a monk. I know why you'd say that, but he's literally a rat. He's shapeshifted into a rat. He's a wise <laughs> druid. <laughs> Hamato Yoshi definitely... Is a druid. He's a shape shifted druid. <laughs> okay. All right. I see it now. That a city guard is going to choke out and ask for answers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And if you want to pull from real history, uh, don't worry because it's just as buck wild as some of these fictional characters. I couldn't pass this up. So I'll throw it in at the end of this segment. We've got a druid from back in the day that went down in legend named Mogroa. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. <laughs> Yes, we usually are. <laughs> but I gave it my best. These are some of the cliff notes. Look them up if you want to know more. 
but this is why he's an epic druid. He could grow to enormous size. His breath caused storms and turned men to stone. He wore a hornless bull hide and a bird mask and flew in a machine called the Roth Ramash, the Ord Wheel. <laughs> he had a chariot driven by two oxen with poles of electrum, sides of glass, and it was equally bright by day and by night. Wow. He had a star-speckled black shield with a silver rim and a stone, which could turn into a poisonous eel when he threw it in the water. <laughs> Of course he did. Where, where can I get one of those? Yes, yes, yes. We As all need seen them. on TV. So the mythology and history of real druids is pretty amazing to look into. So we hope you enjoyed this episode. We hope you got something from it. Definitely, if you're going into druid, take inspiration from some of these specifics but also just lean into your role as a guiding force within the party, a wise guiding force. Even if you're good or evil or somewhere in between, you can still leverage some of these tips to create that more druidic vibe within your character. Absolutely. And I think the, the simplest tip that comes out of this episode that can be applied to any character is be invested in the journeys of your party members. That's going to make any game better. Totally. We now would like to thank the wonderful people that support us and make us amped up enough to keep doing this show. Thank you very much to some of our newest patrons. I see spiders where there are none. Sean J. The Senate. Lucas D. Lila G. The GM Tim. Duke B. Thomas W. Ty N. Heavy Arms, Eric R, Aldrost, Leprechaun, Will HP. Thank you for being the Council of Druidic Elders that gives us the energy we need. And the ideas and the wisdom, because holy shit, we'd be lost without you. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks to Tabletop Audio for the sound effects that you heard in this episode. You can follow us at Hook and Chance on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Reddit. And please, please, if you would like more ideas, join an awesome community of players and DMs by hopping on our Discord. Thanks, Thanks for, for listening, listening and question every rat you see. <laughs>